Good morning, everyone. Greetings of peace to you. The peace and blessings of God be upon you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm so happy to be back here uh, today. Uh, it really does feel like spring has come, being with all of you at the Festival of Faith in this wonderful city of compassion. Compassionate fellows. How do we keep that compassion? How do we restore it? How do we retain it? The Holy Quran says that the sun has been created for you as a source of brilliant light. And the moon reflects that light. We need to try regularly, daily, throughout our lives to keep shining that mirror of the soul so we can reflect the light that comes to us. There's so many ways to do that. And for Muslims, one of the most important ways is to perform our daily prayers, the salah. Now, there's many ways to pray. Sometimes I've, I've said to uh, some people when I've been describing to them what Islamic prayer is, they've said, well, I pray more than five times a day. Um, but this is a specific kind of prayer. It's an embodied prayer. And within the embodied prayer are all other for forms of prayer like blessings, glorification of God, supplication, which is called in Arabic the dua, to call on God, asking for a need. So we pray throughout the day in many, many different ways. But the uh, five embodied prayers are the ones we're going to be focusing on primarily today. You know, prayer is also called dhikr. It's called remembrance. And it's remembering who we are and why we're here. Who we are in relation to our creator, the creator of all things. And this is the major distinction, ontological distinction in Islam, is between the creator and the created beings. And we're one of the created beings. There are many, of course. Uh, so we have to know our responsibility in relationship to our creator and to all the other beings that are around us. And prayer helps us do that. The Prophet Muhammad told his companions that they should think of prayer like a flowing river. He said, if you jumped into a flowing pure stream, a flowing river, five times a day, do you think any dirt would be left on you? And they said, no. He said, this is like your prayer, if you pay attention to it and if you're mindful of it. We are souls who have been created in the presence of God and then are embodied in our mother's wombs. Somehow, we come into this form of being that includes our spirit that originates with the divine, but put in these earthly bodies. We have this difficult passage into our life, into the world. We're placed out here, embodied souls. And that body can be a great ally for us in doing good. It's our companion in this life. And this is why the embodied prayer is such an important part of who we are. It's not just thinking good thoughts. It's not, although that's important, and it's not just feeling a connection with our creator, although that's part of it, but it's bringing all of who we are in this life, embodied beings, into a sense of discipline and purpose and orientation. Now, before we begin our prayer, there are many things that we need to do to prepare. So first of all, I have to know when to pray. I'll tell you something, we're a little bit late for our prayer. <laughs> our first prayer of the day. So the prayers are, um, are timed according to the movements of the sun. 
course, the sun, the source of light, and we should reflect, reflect upon the meaning of that. So we have to know where the sun is in the sky. Our first prayer occurs before the sun comes up, at the first light of dawn, so the first glimmer of dawn until the sun comes up. The sun came up today in Louisville, Kentucky at 7 a.m. The first light of dawn was at a little bit after five o'clock, so any time in that range. Now, of course, during the year, as the Earth moves around the sun, the time the sun rises and the time sun sets, uh, changes every single day. And of course, this is like the calendar of our life. You know, no day is the same as the one that came before. So we have to pay attention. If we're doing everything the same today as we did yesterday, we haven't grown. And that's a problem. The purpose of life is growth. So these movements of the prayer around the calendar as the earth moves around the sun should be a sign for us that we need to pay attention every day to what has changed. So our first prayer is in this early light of dawn. Our second prayer is after the sun reaches the highest point in the sky. And then we have a late afternoon prayer before the sunset. And then when the sun sets until it's becomes dark is our fourth prayer, and the fifth prayer is after full darkness sets in. So where I live in Canada now in the winter, these prayers are really compressed in time. But in the, yeah, in the summer, though, in the summer, it's a very early first prayer, and it's a very late last prayer. And when I was tree planting in northern Canada, uh, there were times when it almost never became fully dark, and then we have to adjust, and this is an amazing thing, to think about how humanity has spread across the globe into all of these places, places that, you know, we may have thought at one time would be impossible for human beings to live, but God gave us these minds and these bodies and creativity to be able to move, and then we have to figure out, well, how do we pray in a place like that? How do you pray the night prayer if it hasn't become fully dark? Which shows that it's impossible to live our religion fully and completely if we don't pay attention to new circumstances and adapt the principles and purposes of what we do to the new times. There have even been Muslim astronauts and then they had to figure out, well, how do I pray if I'm not even on the earth? Uh, so humanity is facing all sorts of challenges, new challenges, and we have to bring our fundamental principles and values and practices into this full new reality and figure out a way to live correctly and right we, rightly and in a good way. So we need to know where we are and, and when we are, but second is the, is the where. Where am I going to pray? Probably, when you've seen images of people in prayer, it's a whole bunch of people in a mosque. For some reason, usually they're shooting them from behind and there's a big pile of shoes behind there. It's not very attractive, so. But um, we don't have to pray in a mosque. The Quran says, the earth has been made uh, pure and clean for you. And the Prophet Muhammad said that the whole earth has been made a mosque for you. Mosque is the English term, uh, translation of masjid, which means a place of prostration. This means that the whole earth is sacred. And we believe that the earth, the actual substance of earth, is pure, like water is pure. So there's purity to the earth, and of course, one of our jobs and our challenges, certainly today, is to keep this earth and the water pure so that we can continue uh, to pray that way. So we can pray any, any place, any place on the earth. But I have to figure out when I'm in a new place, when I travel or move, 
I know I can pray here, but what direction do I pray in? And all Muslims pray in the direction of the Kaaba, the holy sanctuary of God. Now, that doesn't mean that Arabia is more important than any place else in the world. Certainly not that Saudi Arabia is. That's a new nation state formed in the 20th century. Just that place has a very ancient and sacred history. It's a place where Muslims believe Abraham came and reestablished monotheism in the, re in the region with the help and assistance of Hajar, his wife, who through her great efforts discovered the water well through which people could make their ablutions and built this house as a place of worship. So Muslims everywhere in the world will first need to figure out which direction is, the, is Mecca and is the Kaaba. Now here, we figure it out, it is in this direction if you consider the direction the shortest distance between two places, which it is. So it's northeast, which is counterintuitive to a lot of people because many of us will look on a flat map and say, well, if we're in Louisville, Kentucky, you must have to pray east. Uh, but uh, we live in a round earth. So if I were going to do my prayers on the stage today, I would do them in this direction. Uh, having to figure that out motivated Muslims throughout history to understand geography. Um, they certainly knew a, very early on that the earth was round. <laughs> and uh, through those calculations, figured out in every place they were how to orient themselves. Now, what if you don't know? If you don't know, the Quran says, to God belongs the east and the west. Wherever you turn your face, there is the face of God. And so this is a, 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 an important attempt to find the direction, but in the end, it's symbolic. It doesn't mean that you know, God is only there or holiness or prayer. No, it's everywhere. It's wherever we turn, we, find, we can find the face of God. And if we're traveling, we just pray in whatever direction we're traveling in. So now I know where I am in the world. I have figured out the orientation of the sun with respect to me. So I have the when and I have the where. How, how do I pray now? And for Muslims, this is why the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, is so important. We are a religion that follows the traditions of the prophet in terms of acts of worship. And those traditions are passed on from mother to child, from teacher to student, from grandfather to grandson over the generations. Of course, there are books that teach these things, but pretty much no one learns from a book. They learn from someone else. I remember when my son was very young and he uh, had a beloved teacher. And I remember just watching him as he was standing in line in prayer beside his teacher. And he just kept looking over and making little adjustments the whole time because he loved his teacher so much and he wanted to be like him. And that traditional aspect is important because we need role models. We need embodied role models. We need people to show us you know, how to be in this world. And of course, we'll have our own, figure out our own way and have our own creativity and our own perspective. But we are formed uh, through community with others and through role models. And so that's important. And the prayer can be alone or it can be with people. So this is another decision. Uh, we can pray the same prayer by ourselves anytime except for the Friday congregational prayer. Congregational, we have to all come together. Uh, but it's possible to go to the mosque or to go to a prayer center and, and pray in congregation with others or we pray 
um, wherever we are, in our office or school or, you know, when the time comes in, the length of time, the period of time, we've got to figure out a, a way to pray. And this is uh, important too because sometimes we really need to have that experience alone. We need to be able to know how to do it alone. Sometimes we're going to be alone. We're not always going to be around people. And, and many, even though they pray all of their prayers in congregation, they will also do additional supplementary prayers alone later. But it is that, that feeling in congregation and the feeling alone is very different. When we pray in congregation, we you know, snuggle up right beside each other. You're supposed to feel the person beside you. There's a sense of comfort, a sense of almost being hugged by the others, a sense of solidarity. And that's a beautiful feeling. And that's the reason why men and women are separated in congregational prayer, because I'm not sure I want to be really hugged by, you know, any random man who comes in, the <laughs> comes in. So the women will be snuggled up beside each other, and the men will be snuggled up beside each other, and there's that feeling of acting together, a sense of purpose. We're oriented in the same direction, and we're unified together for a common purpose. And we need to do that. There's so many things that need our attention in society. So we have to be able to come together and put aside you know, our own individual ideas about, about what we want to do for the sake of the common good sometimes. But sometimes we also need to pay attention to our own spiritual needs our own task, because we also have tasks that are individual. And sometimes people disappoint us. I know we live in an age when many people are, consider themselves spiritual, not religious, because religion has disappointed them, or the people who have been promoting religion have disappointed them. And there are many Muslims like that. And to regain that sense of of spiritual wholeness, sometimes people need to withdraw from others. And there's a beautiful teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, that when a person prays alone, you know, if a person is alone in the wilderness, sometimes I do this, go out in the woods, and they make the call to prayer, and then they make their prayer with sincerity, that ranks of angels are praying with them. So you're never truly alone. We're never truly alone. The angelic presence comes with us as well. And that's important to remember because this is also an age of great loneliness. Of course, we need to be comfortable when we're not surrounded by others, but we shouldn't be lonely. And so wherever we are, we should remember that we are have the potential to be surrounded by these angelic presences. And of course, the Quran also says that the trees and the grasses all prostrate to their Lord. We know that every aspect of creation is also a Muslim in the sense of being in harmony with the will of God. So we also have all of these other created beings who are praying with us as well. And anyone who, has a, who lives with a, non-human creatures in their house knows that they're going to come around you when you're praying, you know. <laughs> well, I remember, we, we used to, my, my children used to have rabbits, and as soon as you would start praying, the rabbits would, would come, and they'd start, and as soon as I start praying, the cat comes and is right there with me. They feel that there's something special, and they want to be part of it as well. So the final, not the final, but another part of preparing for this, this embodied prayer will be uh, ablution, ritual ablution. To take pure water and to wash hands and arms, face, the top of the head, the feet, in a certain order. And as we do it, think about this as an opportunity to wash away our sins and our misdeeds with a strong intention. 
So there is, again, the physical action is, is reflected on the spiritual level as well, to try to purify ourselves. And of course, this isn't just a, a, you know, a cheap and easy way to be forgiven. It has to be done with a real sense of sincerity. I'm going to try to do better next time. And if water isn't available, if there's no clean water, we can take a little bit of pure earth and take it and wipe our face and just wipe down our arms. And this is a way also to purify ourselves, which again shows the importance of the purity of the earth. So now that I've done this and I'm ready to pray, I think about the purity of my surface. And many of the early Muslims refused to pray on anything but, but the earth. They felt that it was, it was more humbling. It was in line with their asceticism, that they were quite wary of, you know, fancy Persian carpets. Oh, but most of us like fancy Persian carpets, actually. <laughs> and the prayer carpet is simply a way of um, having a clean place. So for me, I have this handy little bag. I keep it in my purse at all times, my sort of, it's kind of like, you know, Superman runs, puts on his cape. So this is my super <laughs> prayer rug. And I'm going to slip off my shoes because they may be a little, a little dirty from what I've been stepping on. It's not necessary, but I will. And I'll lay out my prayer carpet. And that'll give me a nice, clean little surface so I can pray. Take off my glasses. And now I'm standing, we'll pretend this is the right direction. I'm standing and getting ready for my prayer. First thing is to make my intention. I can say it out loud or I can say it internally. That this is a prayer I'm making to worship God out of obedience to God. There can be all sorts of wrong intentions, doing it to show other people that I'm a very prayerful person. That's not the right intention. Now, as I stand here, I may be in just a really excited mood to pray. I'm, fe I'm really feeling it right now. Or I may not be feeling it. I may have had a late night. I'm really groggy. I am not a morning person, frankly. So I'm like, I'm doing it because I have to do it. And that's, that's so important. Many of the things that we do, that we're required to do in terms of our embodied rituals are the so-called pillars of Islam, whether it's prayer or fasting, giving charity. Sometimes we don't really feel it. But there's something about if you do it, you'll start feeling it. It's kind of like, you know, you're not feeling very happy. Smile. And you smile and you know what? Inevitably it works. It starts to make you feel happier. So whether we're feeling it or not, we're going to do it. I'm making my intention. And I have to remember which of the five prayers it is, because each one is a little different. Some of the prayers have, each prayer is a certain number of cycles. And we have no um, indication of why sometimes it's two cycles, or three cycles, or four cycles of standing, bowing, and prostrating. We don't know. It's one of the many mysteries of the universe. You know? the, the acts of worship have purposes, but some parts of them can't really be explained, and that is like so much of life. So if I'm going to be praying my morning prayer, it's two cycles of worship, and then I have to think, is this one where I recite the Quran out loud or quietly? In some cases, in the morning prayer, I recite it out loud. 
and in the evening and in the night prayer. In the day prayer, it's quiet. And I, I've thought about this before, about the meaning of it, because we aren't given the meaning. But I think it's, uh, in terms of its effectiveness, the most difficult thing is to really pay attention when it's a quiet prayer, when I'm silently reciting the Qur'an, because as soon as I'm silently engaged in prayer, it's very easy for my mind to start zinging all over the place. My mind starts wandering. I have parts of the Qur'an that I've memorized that I'm going to be saying, and I can just go through the motions. You know, this is truly the biggest challenge of prayer, is to have full awareness. And it's a, it's a struggle within ourselves. And so reciting out loud, it allows us to say those passages of the Qur'an, say those prayers out loud, to have others correct us if we're wrong. That's helpful. But silently, it allows us to have that greater discipline of a being, paying attention, being mindful of what we're doing. So now I'm going to be praying the morning prayer. I have two cycles of prayer, and I'm going to be um, reciting the Quran out loud. And so I stand in my direction, and I begin with what's called the takbir, the opening glorification of God, Allahu Akbar. Now, Allahu Akbar means God is greater. What is God greater than? God is greater than every image we can have of who God is. God is greater than all of the things that we love, all of the things that we desire, all of the things that we say about God. And that is the acknowledgement that our, our understanding is very limited, always limited, never complete. And it should make us humble vis-a-vis -vis all others who have different perceptions and understandings. So I begin, and I, I open, and I say, God is greater. And then either I fold my hands across my chest, or I hold my arms at my side. And this depends on the tradition. There are many traditional schools. Uh, of uh, thought and practice in Islam, and, and all of them are, they're all good, and we can all pray together with these different postures. And I say some internal uh, prayers that I am turning my, myself, I'm turning my face to the one who has created the heavens and the earths, all of the things that have created as someone who's trying to follow this primordial religion of God, which is very ancient. The Quran says that Islam is, simply means submission to God. It is what we are all born with, a, a desire to be in harmony and in submission to our Creator. And so I begin by praying, and I will pray part of the Qur'an, I'll always start with the first surah, the first chapter of the Qur'an. And as I, after I've made my opening prayer, I will bow my head, and I'm starting in the standing position, because we are human beings and we have a certain dignity that God has given us. The Qur'an says God has placed dignity in all human beings. So we have this dignity of standing, but humility. And I'll begin with the opening chapter of the Qur'an. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. Maliki Yawmiddin. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Sirat al-lazina na'amta alayhim. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. آمين. Amen. It's followed by Amin. And then I'll recite something else, a little passage of the Quran, and it can be from, you know, anything that I that I know. Uh, if I were to stand here and recite the whole Quran, it would take over a day. So there's a lot to choose from, depending on my mood, what's in my mind, what I feel. And then once I go through this, 
I will move to the next cycle of prayer, which is the one of bowing. And each, each position, I should try to be still. Take my time in that. So bowing is a form of submission, knowing that I am worshiping God. My, my life is to serve you and to serve others because that is what you have commanded me. So I bow, and then I come up, and then I will go to prostration, which is the um, place where I feel the most humble, but also the, somehow the closest to God. I feel I'm coming very close to the earth, and the earth is from where I have come. The Quran says human beings were created out of earth, out of soil, out of clay, and we know that we will go back to the earth. So I come and I make my prostration. And then go back to a sitting. And then I'm going to repeat that. That's one cycle of prayer after I've done that twice. And I'm going to sit. And then I'm going to repeat that till I come to the end. And in each position that I move to, I make some glorification of God, and I make my own prayers. And so this, is, this prayer is a combination of both what is traditional and required, but also my own needs that day, praying for my family, my friends, for this earth, for you, for whatever is on my mind and in my heart, and feeling very close and doing that. And then at the end, I will say, Assalamu alaikum. And I may turn this way and say, Assalamu alaikum. And that's giving greetings of peace to those who are on my right and left humans, angels, and whatever else is in creation. And then afterwards, I may follow my, this prayer with some supplications, some remembrances of God. And so there's the before preparation and there's the after to kind of come um, to finish it up. I'm feeling refreshed spiritually. I'm feeling a sense of community. I've reoriented myself. I have a sense of purpose. I'm going to get up and I'm going to be going back now out to my day until the next time comes for another prayer. And between this prayer and the next one, I'm going to forget myself. I'm going to be irritable sometimes. I'm going to, you know, maybe say some things that are not very kind to people. Um, but the time for prayer will come again. And I'll tell you, the only thing I miss, the only thing I miss when I'm not in a Muslim-majority country is hearing that call for prayer. It's so lovely when it floats through the air and is the reminder to you. But many of us have, a, have an app on our phone. <laughs> It's not the same thing. <laughs> but when it comes, then I'll start again. I'll reorient myself. I'll remember where I am. I'll come back to my sense of purpose. I'll re recommit myself to who I am and to what I have to do. So that is our prayer. Thank you so much for your attention today. And my prayer is that God blesses all of us and allows us to grow and to be those people who reflect this beautiful light of compassion. Thank you.